After several years of high precipitation, all five Great Lakes have been at or near record levels for much of the past year. Homeowners along the lakes have had to take expensive measures to move, protect, or demolish their houses before the waves or erosion could claim them. The high water threatens public property too, and along Michigan's Great Lakes shoreline, the longest of any U.S. state, many waterfront cities are facing mounting bills. The Michigan Municipal League has been tallying the cost of high water to the state city since 2019, and the number is still climbing. Harrisana Richards is a legislative associate with the Michigan Municipal League. Well, the number that we have, approximately $70 million, isn't complete. We are recognizing right now in this crisis that there's a shortage of people who are able to contract and do this work and also do those actual infrastructure projects. So you'll have a lot of communities, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, who are still waiting to get someone to come out and assess their damage and also get those estimates to really know where they are. And so that number has been growing by the day, by the month. Waterfront towns like South Haven on Michigan's western shore have incurred millions of dollars of unplanned costs. The city is a favorite of summer tourists, but record high water has shrunk the city's sugar sand beaches. And on March 5th, the city canceled its annual July 3rd fireworks, a major tourist draw and economic driver, not because of COVID-19, but out of concern that high water and waves could make it dangerous to launch from the city's iconic pier. Later that month, water levels hit another summer attraction, the city's marinas. Kate Hozier is South Haven's interim city manager and harbor master. We have four municipal marinas. The harbor is kind of right in the middle, like the heart of it, and the city wraps around it. It's a vital part of what makes South Haven South Haven. There's a huge economic driver that is the port with all the transient boaters that come in from the seasonal boaters who stay here. By closing the marina, you no longer have the revenue and now you have to pay for it. So you're kind of getting hit twice. You have to come up with the money that, to make the repairs. And then, of course, you're not getting the revenue because you can't have boats in the slopes. I would say that the high water issues have caused repairs and fixes in the range of between four and five million. Of course, the costs don't end with the marinas. On April 29th, after heavy rains, the city saw widespread flooding along its riverfront. Bill Hunter is South Haven's director of public works. That day, I was constantly running around worried. I kept checking all the spots. You lose sleep when that happens. The water was high enough to threaten the city's wastewater treatment plant on the banks of the Black River. Here at this plant, this area was all underneath water, but we had these pumps here at the time, which helped us. We just had them installed. They only been running for a few weeks. Probably if that would have happened prior to the pumps, we would have had sanitary sewer overflows, meaning the sanitary sewer would flood into the Black River and to Lake Michigan untreated. That would be the worst case scenario. In a normal year, you would just see the water like a creek going by, see the water just flowing. Now it's, it's just kind of stagnant. The city has had to run pumps to move the treated water out of the plant. Without the pumps, things could get ugly for anyone connected to the sewer lines. The wastewater treatment plant is now protected by lines of HESCO barriers, sand-filled containers that form a wall to stop water and waves. In May, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers helped to install more barriers on South Haven's waterfront, but they aren't protecting the beach. They're protecting the city's water filtration plant and a critical one million gallon reservoir of drinking water that's buried beneath the sand. If you don't have that holding tank, you basically have to issue a, a system-wide boil notice. So all 11,000 people would have to immediately start boiling their water to be able to use. Elsewhere in the community, flooding has remained a problem. Around the intersection of Dunkley and Wells, the spring floods never left. That whole area is still flooded. We have two pumps already in there to dewater the area. We did that last year. This year, those pumps can't keep up, so we're proposing to put in more sandbags plus the Tiger Dam system. That's an $82,000 expense, not budgeted. Early estimates put the total cost at 11 to $20 million. As of early July, the high end of that range is looking more accurate. Of course, these problems are not without precedent. In 1986, during the last round of record-setting water levels, governments asked the International Joint Commission to prepare a report and recommend actions. 
Rob Sisson is one of the IJC's U.S. commissioners. When you read through it, the, the, the theme of climate change comes through loud and clear. Coastal resiliency, a lot of recommendations for infrastructure, for municipalities around the Great Lakes. And those largely have sat on a shelf for the intervening years because the water levels came right down. Sisson hopes that this time, lessons learned will be acted upon. I know communities are hurting and they're going to need millions and millions of dollars of assistance to bring their systems up to speed. It's going to be more than local governments can handle. The high water emergency that exists today does give us, I think, the ability to bring governments together and stakeholders together to discuss, let's put a plan in place for the long term. Let's get together. Let's, let's build a resiliency plan for the future because we know we're going to face higher highs and lower lowers in the future.